this Lowrider 2 mostly printed CNC router is possibly the best value large format machine for makers. Today we're going to make it even better with some upgrades. If you're looking to get started in CNC milling, there's a lot of cheap small format CNC routers available from China. In fact, I've reviewed one before. But if you want to cut big sheets of material, it's hard to beat something like this Lowrider 2, which can be scaled up to match whatever table you like. Since I built it, I've had a steady stream of queries asking for an update, so this video is exactly that. This might be the first time you're seeing the Lowrider 2, so let me explain exactly what it is. The Lowrider 2 is by V1 Engineering, whose most famous model is the MP or mostly printed CNC. The Lowrider 2 differs from that in that you can make it as big as you want as it uses a table as its base. In my case, I used one of my two work tables that sit in the middle of this room. This is a build it yourself product, with many of the parts being 3D printed and the rest being easy to source, including from the V1 Engineering shop. Step by step instructions are included for all assembly steps. If you're looking to see more detail, I have a playlist where I built this in three stages. This includes printing all of the parts, machining the plywood frame pieces, step-by-step -step assembly of all of the components, wiring and firmware for an SKR version 1.3, as well as a custom touchscreen with buttons for specific CNC functions. The final installment in that series shows me putting the machine through its paces, including a demonstration of it successfully cutting aluminium sheet although I did have one flaw in my build, and that was that I used a cordless router that noticeably lost cutting power as the battery voltage diminished. After the videos, I replaced the cordless router with a corded one, and the last time I featured the Lowrider 2 on the channel was cutting the large electronics panel for the back of the Ratrig V-Core 3, as this panel was too big to fit in any of my other CNC routers or my laser cutter. Sometimes people question the function of this machine who invariably haven't even used it. All I can say is that the Lowrider 2 works. The acrylic panel that I cut for the rat rig was a perfect fit and allowed me to build and operate that printer successfully. But that doesn't mean we can't improve my Lowrider 2 with quality of life and reliability updates. The first thing that I want to upgrade is the belt tensioning system, which as you can see here is quite convoluted. Let's have a look at this on the machine and you can see quite a lot of pieces of belt and a tiny slither of red, which is a spacer piece, and trust me, it's easy to lose. A Lowrider 3 is coming soon and will probably fix this, but it's not available yet. However, we're not stuck because the MPCNC was updated to a version called the Primo, and it's hard to see here, but the belt system has been completely reworked. We have a sliding block inside the printed piece, and then a tensioning bolt on the end, in my opinion a much more elegant solution, but this is the MPCNC, not the Lowrider 2. But this is where the community comes in, with Calster Computers remixing the original Lowrider 2 parts to add the Primo style belt tensioner. But the internal piece and the housing, there's a mirrored version of each, which means you need four in total to cover the four corners of the machine for the Y-axis belts. I printed these with a high infill in red X3D PLA, using the Ratrig V-Core 3, which the Lowrider 2 had helped to build. And with these Y-axis tensioner parts, our first upgrade is ready to go. There were a few designs like this available on Thingiverse, but what I liked about this one is the exterior dimensions match the originals. I did find the clearances a little tight between the two pieces, however, most likely due to the barely drooping bridge section on the inside. I rectified this with a small file on the housing, and I also smoothed the outside of the tensioning piece, until they could interface a little easier. It was then time to cut the cable ties that form the basis of the old belt tensioning system, and then unbolting the old bracket from the side of my table. And as the new housing has mostly the same dimensions, it was simply a matter of bolting it in place using the existing holes. To prep the internal piece, we need to insert an M5 lock nut. It goes to the bottom before sliding sideways into position where we can visually inspect its alignment. The belt is then inserted by folding around on itself and squeezing down into the cavity provided until the top is flush. Ideally, this is a very snug fit as you're seeing here. We can then slide the internal piece into place, insert a long M5 bolt, engage the threads and give it a few turns to take up the slack. For the opposite end, I found the existing belts were way too long, but rather than cut them and risk them being too short, I simply chose to remove them from the internal piece 
shorten the length where the belt was folded over, and once I had inserted the belt and made sure the threads would engage, only then did I use some side cutters to remove the excess belt. And with that, for the Y axis of the Lowrider 2, I have an easy to use tensioning system without the reliance on any cable ties. But what about the X axis, which also uses the same cable tie belt system for tensioning? Cows to Computers design only covers the Y axis, but a remix from DNA is available to take care of the X axis in the same way. We have a standard and a mirrored housing, and then we print two of the internal pieces released by Cows to Computers. Just like for the Y axis, the replacement parts are very similar dimensionally, with the primary changes being the new tensioning system, and the cap on top to hold the angled aluminium is separate, which would benefit me later on. Assembly once again is straightforward. We cut the cable ties for the existing belt, and undo fasteners until the old printed piece can be removed from the machine. The replacement piece, with its top cap in position, goes into the same spot as the old piece, the only real difference being that it's thicker, which means the old hardware will no longer reach. M4 would be the ideal size, but I didn't actually have any long enough on hand, so instead I carefully opened up the balls with a 5mm drill bit, and used some M5 by 45mm bolts, which seemed to be pretty much perfect. Nothing left to do but to insert the old belt, which seemed to be the perfect length, into the internal pieces and then use more M5 bolts to tension the X axis. When I went to home the machine, I found that a custom piece I previously designed to hold end stop switches was fouling on the new belt housing, but there was very little overlap, so all that was required was a quick Dremel to remove the corner of the printed piece. And with this, the belt tensioning system for both X and Y was completely overhauled and operational. This was the number one design feature that I disliked when building this machine, so quite frankly I'm thrilled with the new system. Next up, some cable management. You'll notice that after adding the corded router, I've just got the cable for it dangling out the front. So this is one area that needs fixing, but the main one I'm worried about is the loom for the x-axis stepper that technically could reach underneath and be cut by the router. My ideal solution for this is a cable chain, but I didn't have a length long enough, so isn't it lucky that I have 3D printers to make my own? The design I went for is an oldie but a goodie, this open cable chain from Claghorn. It's got a range of variants with STLs as well as source CAD for each in case you need to remix. Included are links as well as end pieces. The individual chain links clip together and their print orientation means that they have enough flex without losing strength. The top is open to put your cables in and then we have this spring piece as a cover and the ends of this spring have a dovetail shape so they can't pop out. We're putting one side, compress the spring to line up the other and when we release the cables will be held inside nicely. This is a popular classic design and for good reason. For the Lowrider 2 I used two end pieces and 48 links which I printed in sets of 12. The top pieces are designed to hold the aluminium in a 45 degree V configuration. So I remixed the design to simplify it and hold one side of the aluminium flat. I installed the new caps, lined up where the holes should be and drilled them. This gave me a flat surface to rest the cable chain on so I bolted one side down into position. Around this time, I ran the cords for the X-stepper as well as the router through the middle of the cable chain and installed the spring clips on top. This did take a few minutes to do 48, but I much prefer this than trying to feed the cords through. The other side needs to be attached to the router, so I measured up the router body and designed this simple clamp to do just that. There was just enough flex in this piece to slide it down over the top of the router before rotating it into position and clamping it shut. The other end piece of the cable chain then bolts into it. The result, the cables for the x-axis stepper motor as well as the mains powered router are helped securely out of the way through the full range of travel. And to keep the rest of the wires out of the way, I put them in the sheathing and cable tied them to these stick-on mounts that went on the other side of the aluminium profile. That is a potential safety hazard fixed, but there was still one more area that really needed addressing. The electronics housing I was using was now useless because it was designed to be mounted on a V piece of aluminium. But beyond this, it was only ever a stopgap solution as it was designed for a different board and the ports didn't quite line up. The same goes for the top half, which was designed for a different LCD, hence the gaps and extra holes, but worst of all, access to the SD card that was needed for me to run any job was only through the inside and that meant pulling the lid off to access the card. And last but certainly not least, 
this powering solution to the main board is less than ideal and potentially unreliable. There was actually a bunch of Lowrider 2 mainboard cases available, but none of them to suit my specific mainboard and my specific touchscreen. So I jumped on Onshape and this is what I came up with. The lower half of this case passes the wires through the bottom instead of the back, which should be neater. The ports actually line up for the mainboard USB and SD card, and the power input is in the back with a clamp for the supplied adapter. I made up a new short power cable with some properly crimped connectors, and as you can see, the barrel jack adapter has a nice place to sit and is held in place by this small retaining clip. On the underside, I have this leg designed to slide over the aluminium profile and hold the case on a slight angle. And there's four potential mounting spots to ensure flexibility. I ran the X-axis stepper cable through a grommet to the correct location, slid on the mounting legs to their approximate location, and then bolted the lower half in place. There's nothing particularly special about the upper half of the case. It's just that it's designed to fit my specific MKS TFT28 touchscreen and that the SD card for that is now easily accessible. It bolts onto the top to finish the assembly. To finish tidying up the wiring, I had a couple more simple parts I designed to hold the power brick as well as a power board to one side of the machine. Previously, I made myself a nice spoil board with an array of threaded inserts that were used to hold 3D printed clamps and secure the workpiece. The only trouble is that I was clamping the spoil board to the table, but only from one side, which is less than ideal. So on a small sacrifice to the top of my table, I installed four threaded inserts. These line up with some countersunk holes in the spoil board, positioning it much more securely and without clamps in the way. And this subtle change makes my Lowrider 2 just that little bit more user friendly. And that is where my Lowrider 2 is currently at. I was gonna cut something just for the sake of showing it off, but I decided not to waste the material. If you have a Lowrider 2 with the same components as me, I've uploaded all of the files and the source CAD to printables. If you don't have one and you're interested in building one, my advice is to go for it, but perhaps wait until the Lowrider 3 is released. This machine can be built to suit whatever size table you want, and it conveniently homes to the side out of the way when you're not using it. Mine already functioned properly, but now it's much nicer to use, so you can expect to see some projects using it in the future. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy budget CNC routing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.